Coming up next on Primary Care, depression in black men. Many suffer in silence. We are alone at the very time that we really need to be reaching out to others. Hello, and welcome to Primary Care. I'm your host, Dr. Lonnie Joe. Depression is one of the most common mental disorders in the United States and affects an estimated 17 million people each year. Black men are just as likely as anyone to have depression, but less likely to get help for it. Left untreated, depression can lead to chronic conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, sexual dysfunction, substance abuse, and even death. According to the Centers for Disease Control, suicide is the third leading cause of death for African-American males aged 15 through 24. Black men can no longer live in silence and in the shadows of this treatable condition. Here to share more light on this topic is Dr. Harold Woody Neighbors. Dr. Neighbors is a CS Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. His research focuses on developing community-based programs that improve the health of black men. Dr. Neighbors, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you for, for joining us, me. Woody. Excellent. Depression, everybody has touched it or have been embraced by it sometimes in their life. Black men seem to suffer disproportionately from the disease. Black men, why? Well, it's not clear to me that we suffer disproportionately from disease, from the disease of depression, but I have to say that we, more than any other group, are not getting the help that we need so the results and not getting the help out. that we deserve. Good point. So the yeah. results of being depressed stands out because it's untreated. Exactly. So I think the question that comes up is why won't black men seek help. I mean, it's just that simple. Now that's a general problem for all men, uh, but I think it's a more pressing problem for uh, black men. And it's not just for depression, it's for some of the other uh, conditions that you mentioned, diabetes, hypertension. We have a problem in reaching out to get the help that we need. Yeah, in my office, they're the last ones through the door, and, yeah. you know, in terms of uh, complaints, and then they don't complain as much. I mean, right. they're so stoic with their own yeah. assessment yeah. of themselves. I mean, it leads to other problems. But if you had to define depression for our, our viewing audience, how, how would you define it? So the way I think about depression is in very personal terms. Uh, you can look in the diagnostic manual of the American Psychiatric Association and you can read through the list of symptoms. I don't really recommend that people do that. I think there's a more basic way that we can understand uh, depression. And the first point I want to make is that depression is not normal sadness. I'll say that again. It is not normal sadness. I think a lot of folks are, uh, I think, too loose with that word depression. They say, oh, I'm depressed. What, that, what they're really saying is I'm just kind of having a bad day, a slow day. That, that is not depression. There is a difference. Oh, it's a clinical difference. And so, for example, um, one way I think we ought to think about this is that you really, truly don't feel like you are your normal self. I think all of us have a sense of, you know, who we are, what we like to do during the day. So, for example, uh, when I get up in the morning, uh, I'm fired up and ready to go. I've had uh, a period in my life where I was going through a very, very low period uh, due to the loss of a child. So I was just devastated from the whole experience. So I didn't feel like getting up in the morning, even though I had a job to go to, I didn't want to. The thing I enjoy most in the morning is a good hot shower. When I was going through this depressive episode, the thought of getting up and turning on the water and stepping into that shower seemed like an insurmountable task. 
those are the kinds of things that you can look at to start to figure out, are you really into something where you need to get some professional advice about your mood? Some of the other things a person ought to look at, trouble concentrating. You know, I, I mean, because of my job, I'm concentrating all the time. But I would, I would have periods where I'm in a conversation with someone like you, and my mind is just off somewhere else. Trouble concentrating, uh, overeating, undereating, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, um, not enjoying the kinds of things that you typically do. Those are all uh, indicators of perhaps being depressed. But I want to emphasize that um, for most of us walking around, if you're feeling like you're in significant emotional pain, that is the time for us to get over as men, whatever it is that's holding us back from getting help and getting to a qualified uh, professional person, either a primary care physician, a social worker, or a psychologist who can walk you through the assessment to figure out whether you really are clinically depressed. So we need to embrace the idea if nothing else, mm -hmm. as, as men, patients, and particularly black men. Mm -hmm. At the opening, we, 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 we quoted a uh, statistic, suicide in black men between the ages of 15 and 24 right. being the third leading cause of death. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think people really know that. No. I think a lot of people walk around thinking suicide is a quote unquote white thing. Now, let's be clear, the suicide rates for white Americans, particularly white men, is higher than it is for black men. But certain age groups within black male community, we are, you know, see a spike and you've picked out uh, the group that is of most concern. So if we were to look at the conditions that exist in that age group, not just depression and some of the other things, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're probably not dealing with a lot of the long-term uh, disease states necessarily. They're not old enough. They haven't set right. in just yet. We may see some of the beginnings of it, but they haven't set in yet. But there are other social mm -hmm. factors, mm -hmm. so there are other social environmental factors right. that affect that age group, and they wind up depressed at alarming rates. Yeah. So in my opinion, um, all of this goes back to social determinants. And when I say social determinants, I'm primarily interested in uh, education, and uh, employment. The way those social determinants affect the black community, you take another step back and that is really the legacy of racism and slavery that has, I mean, that's really laid the unfortunate context with which a lot of us are dealing right now. So even though my research focuses more on the people who are experiencing the symptoms, we, we can't ever forget that the, the social determinants are really what's driving a lot of this. So the research that I'm doing now, and a lot of it was done in Detroit, the younger guys in our uh, groups, our research groups, are talking about the loss of hope for the future. So hopelessness is one of the big problems. Hopelessness is, by the way, another indicator of depression can be, uh, but in my opinion, it's the lack of economic opportunity coupled with uh, poor educational preparation that is saying to many of our young men that they're not seeing a positive future for them. Um, suicide could be one result of that, and I might add uh, access to uh, handguns is another uh, problem. So the infiltration, the, the increased infiltration of, of, of handguns in un underserved communities is really startling. Um, yes. Woody, in the African American community, the, the church plays a big role. The spiritual lives of people uh, has always been a big role, but in the African American community, it's different and it's special. I ask patients all the time, where you go to church, um, they identify with a church, even, even if they haven't been in a very long time. They mm -hmm. identify with a minister. When it comes to this disease state of depression, where does the role of the church come in, the role of the pastor, uh, and this interaction with black men? Where, 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 what role does that play and where does it come in with, with African-American men? 
Well, to be honest, I wish we knew more about that question. Uh, it does come into play, but I think the point we're trying to make is that uh, we as black men need to take even more advantage of the kind of things that the church and you know people that we know that are members of our church can offer us uh, when we're in uh, a high distress uh, situation. So the general answer to your question is yes. The black church plays a very important role. Uh, I have colleagues at the University of Michigan who have been doing research on this for years. The very first paper that I published back in the early 80s, when we asked people, what do you do when you're under uh, serious stress, one of the top things they talked about was prayer. So that's one place where I think black men are probably uh, relying on uh, assistance to get through tough times. But the problem is that we as men are probably not revealing our stress to our church members, to our family, friends at the level, family and friends at the level that we should. That's very true because we see so many people <clears throat> in the family come along and say, I didn't know he didn't had know. this problem. Yeah, I mean, when you say something like that, it reminds me of Don Cornelius. Yes, Soul Train. I mean, Train. everybody watched Soul Train <laughs> all the time. Don Cornelius' son, you know, Don Cornelius committed suicide, unfortunately. His own son said those very words. I did not know my father was in such pain. Part of the reason he did not know, is my speculation is that Don Cornelius didn't really reveal the pain that he's in. So you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we tend to hold a lot of things in. So the spiritual aspect of this is clear in terms of being a benefit if we would embrace it. Absolutely. But there's also treatment. Yes. Medi medical treatment, treatments mm -hmm. of, of, of other sorts, different approaches that help people deal with and overcome their depression. Will you speak to that? Well, <laughs> this is where it can get kind of interesting. One of the things I, I guess I'd like to let folks know is when you get to the point where you're feeling like, uh, you know, whatever's going on with me, it's pretty extreme. I need to get a professional's opinion. I would encourage people that if they can afford it, to get more than one opinion. Because a lot of the times the treatment you get is gonna depend on to whom you're asking. So if you end up going to your primary care physician for assistance, uh, I think you're gonna be more likely to receive medication for your symptoms. And medication for many of these uh, symptoms uh, helps. But let's say you went to a psychologist or a social worker, they're not really, uh, they don't have the ability to write a prescription. They may uh, advocate more of a talking therapy. Now my opinion is that the combination of both is, is probably the way to go. So those options are out there for folks. I think a lot of us aren't aware uh, that the kind of help you might get depends on who you ask. The other thing to keep in mind is going back to your point about the church. Very often your symptoms of depression can improve over time with what we call good old fashioned social support. Now, I'm not advocating that people not see professional help, but I do want to put the word out there that emphasizes your point that uh, community, you know, people, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation can have an impact on the symptoms. What, what puts us at risk as black men is when we work ourselves into so we paint ourselves into a corner of social isolation. We are alone at the very time that we really need to be reaching out to others. That's a very good point, especially in the senior citizen mm -hmm. age groups and populations. They suffer most from desocialization than anybody in our society. Yes. So you take an elderly black man who's 
in this situation with an issue, mm -hmm. he's going to suffer even more. Yeah. I, th I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, I mean, one thing we should all be against is loneliness. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, people help people. Right. But I mean, even, so, yeah, pe yeah, I mean, you know, th yeah. this stuff is complicated on one hand, but on another hand, it's, it's, it's really simple. If I'm in pain and you and I are close, why wouldn't I reach out to you? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, sometimes it's inexplicable. Uh, but on the other hand, when you start thinking deeply about it, there, there's some ways that we were raised and socialized from the time we were boys that can sometimes put a barrier between two very good friends. I, I don't want to tell you that I'm going through something because I'm so wrapped up in my concern about what are you going to think of me and vice versa. We men need to get over that. When the, a big portion of the treatment may be your ability to express it to someone else. Yes. That's, that's very important. Yes. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back more with Dr. Neighbors and Depression. One in four of us will be affected by mental illness at some point in our lives. Yet nearly two thirds of us will never seek help, especially men. We pride ourselves on courage and our ability to never show weakness. But mental health touches us all. We are athletes, actors, and musicians. We are friends, husbands, and fathers. It's one of us, it's one of you. It's time for men to talk about mental health. Help starts with the conversation in the stigma. To learn more about our stories, visit bringchangethemind.org. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Woody Neighbors, the CS Mont Endowed Professor of Public Health at the Michigan State College of Human Medicine. Woody, you head up a program called Man Up, Man Down. Yeah. Tell us about that program. Yeah, Man Up, Man Down. I love talking about Man Up, Man Down. Um, I'll give you a short version of that. Man Up, Man Down started as a research study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I mentioned earlier how I uh, was getting a case of uh, description fatigue and I wanted to move my research much closer to the uh, community, to the neighborhood, to the men that I was concerned about. So we did a series of focus groups in four urban settings, including Detroit. And the focus group essentially getting around a uh, table with about six or seven men and just talking, trying to get the stories out. What's going on with us men? Let's tell the truth. And that's what Man Up, Man Down was. And we did all of our interviews at the University of Detroit Mercy. After every group, two, three men would say, when's the next meeting? And we would say, no, didn't we tell you that this was a research study? There's no next meeting. And they'd say, why not? Uh, we really enjoyed this. Uh, we actually feel better. And this little light bulb went off in my head is that, huh, uh, we need to have more meetings like this. So Man Up, Man Down transitioned from a research study to what we now call man-to-man -man health dialogues. But I think the thing you really want to know is where did that phrase come from, man up, man down? That's what I guess get asked all the time. Like, right. it, what is it's, that? It's, yeah. it's kind of opposite directions. Yeah, right? opposite directions. <laughs> In fact, if you look at our logo, uh, you know, the man down letters are upside down. Right. And, and so this came out of um, some conversations that we were having. And I noticed that when I'm with, you know, the guys that I hang out with, if we ever start talking about personal, you know, uh, issues, personal problems. And I say if, because most of the time we don't talk about that. You know, we're talking about the tigers, the lions, uh, cars, televisions, you know, bigger televisions, you know. Uh, but if the conversation turned personal, people would listen for a while and inevitably somebody would say, I don't know, man, you just need to man up. And I started thinking, what do we mean when we say that to another guy? You just need to man up. Well, I think what we're saying is, I don't really know how I can help you. I've heard enough about your personal situation. It's time for you to go somewhere and handle your business. And so we started saying sometimes manning up can result in a man going down. So in other words, no man, especially no black man, should be expected to be able to handle every problem that life is going to throw at you. Uh, that's just unreasonable. 
Manning up may work some of the time, but it's not going to work all the time. So manning up can result in a man going down. But again, here's the good news, that if you reach out for help, family, friends, or professionals, and you're the man down, you can be the man up again very quickly. So that's the story of man up, man down. Interesting dichotomy. Yeah. Um, you, when you talk about men's health, in the past you've referred to something called the four Ds. What are you talking about when you? Right. So this is one of those quick elevator speeches. You know, we all try to come up with. Uh, you only got a few minutes. The take you're trying message. to get your point across. Yes, yeah. So uh, I came up with the five Ds. The five and, Ds. Yeah. Five. Five Ds. Um, so it's uh, depression diabetes, dental health, disparities, and Detroit. So I would run around saying, I'm the guy with the five Ds, and then I'd whip them off and I'd say, if you're interested in any one of these Ds, then you and I need to get together and talk. So those are the five Ds. How about that? I'm, and touching on a lot of aspects, a broad range mm -hmm. of what affects African-American men. Exactly. And it's gotta be in the top seven of yeah. everything that we look at. Yeah, yeah. I've always been interested in disparities. And I know in my own life, I've been struggling with uh, type 2 diabetes for over 20 years. And I can go on and on and talk about that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, I've gone through my low mood periods. Yeah, you and I share the, 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 the same thing in terms of the loss of a child. Yes. Oh, yes, I, I didn't know that. Yes, we do. So yeah, it's, it's the most devastating thing absolutely. anyone could ever go through. Absolutely. You know, I get, I get emotional just uh, thinking about it. I'm, I'm very sorry that, that you had to go through yeah, that. Yeah, I for you also. However, mm -hmm. there is a different side of that coin that yeah. says that we can, can uh, be down, um, mm -hmm. man down can become a man up. Uh, yes, in, I mean. In terms of depression associated with, with a loss of a loved one. Yeah, and it's so true, and I can speak to it on a personal level as you can. Uh, there were many, many days when I never thought I would get back up and um, was prepared to kind of live life down. Um, the smartest thing I think I did was my two best friends. Uh, I called them and I said, you know, once I get through all of the, the you know, funeral arrangements, uh, promise me that you'll go for a walk with me at least once a week. And I don't even know where I came up with that. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they came through. The three of us would go walking once a week and just talking about anything and everything. And that slowly but surely helped me kind of get back to where, you know, I wanted to be. Let's shift gears for just mm -hmm. a minute. In the middle of the, the city of Flint's water crisis, uh, I know that your relocation to Flint yeah. uh, there, this is something that's near and dear to your heart also. What do you see the future of the citizens? What does the future hold for the citizens of Flint, Michigan, as it relates to this water crisis? Because we're not looking at a snapshot here in this, in this yeah. issue. It's, this, is, this is all a video and it's gonna go on for a while. Yes. What, what are your hopes for the future? Well, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. This is not, in fact, I don't even use the word crisis most of the time because now that I've been living in Flint for you know eight months or so and I've talked to a lot of folks, uh, they have had serious concerns about water and infrastructure for a long time. It just so happens that this version of it hit the media. So that's one thing we need to think about. This is a chronic situation. And so you're absolutely right. It's gonna be with us for a long time. My hope and vision would be that they replace the pipes, which as you know, is gonna cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. Uh, most of the people in Flint still are not drinking tap water. Uh, there's still a lot of bottled water uh, being drunk. So um, that's my ultimate dream for Flint, that they would fix this situation. But even more importantly, um, I really want to see jobs come back to Flint. Uh, again, we, we, we think a lot about social determinants. And I know, you know physicians, even though people think of physicians as only concerned with um, patient care, uh, I think most ph physicians understand that the, the illness and disease that you treat comes from uh, chronic stressful situations. So in a, in a 
you know, weird way, I think you would want to be put out of business by somebody going upstream and just eliminating uh, the high degree of unemployment in Flint. The poverty rate is like 40, 41 percent. That's, that's ri ridiculous. So my vision of Flint would be that those things would be taken care of. But in the meantime, to be real about it, uh, I've decided to focus my research and my intervention programs on behavior and lifestyle. The kinds of things that you and I and the rest of our brothers can do to take care of, you know, feelings of grief or hypertension, uh, diabetes. I mean, there's still a lot of things that yeah, we can do. We've got a lot of unfinished business in those We have areas. a lot of unfinished yes. business and a lot that we need to understand about behaving ourselves. One of which is getting to the doctor regularly. But another aspect of it is what are we going to do when we leave the doctor's office? Woody, thank you for joining us. We will certainly do this it was, again. It was a real thank honor. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Harold Woody Neighbors, the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health at the Michigan State College of Human Medicine. For Primary Care, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe. You can get more information about the show and our guests at primarycare-tv.com and continue the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs>